Good afternoon and welcome to the 47th episode of the RSN's COVID-19 series, which is for health professionals by health professionals and designed to give workers on the front lines regular updates from healthcare leaders on COVID-19. Today we have um, Professor David Eisenberg from UCL and he is going to tell us about the most severe cases and the inflammatory response. And in the most severe cases of COVID-19, the virus causes an aggressive auto-inflammatory response, also called the cytokine storm. And this causes the body to attack itself, sometimes leading to lifelong organ damage. We discuss how to analyze the data from the blood test to guide the immune responses, and also look at treatments, which are corticosteroids and other treatments to help dump down the cytokine pathway and reduce the damage to the organs. So I'd like to introduce and bring into the conversation Professor David Eisenberg, very welcome. Thank yes. you for coming. Thank you, delighted to be here. Great, thank you, David. Uh, so we had a lot of questions um, from the delegates and they sent them through in advance, which is always very helpful. So I think incorporated them into the, the questions that I, the framework of, um, of the system I have done today. So uh, we'll start off with what is the cytokine storm in COVID-19 and generally how many days from the beginning of the symptoms does this occur? So thanks Stephanie. So probably worthwhile just reminding ourselves that uh, cytokines are simply small molecules. They are derived from a variety of cells, macrophages, B cells, T cells, mast cells. Uh, they're involved in cell signaling. And they're part of the body's innate response to infection, but their sudden release in large amounts is what causes the, the real problems. Uh, and of course, they act through cell surface receptors. Uh, and they include the chemokines, the interferons, interleukins, TNF, and the storm, the cytokine storm, a term which incidentally was first quoted, first utilized in 1993 by a guy called Ferrara in the context of graft versus host disease, uh, is when the innate system, innate immune system, gives rise for reasons which are still not entirely clear to a completely uncontrolled and excessive release of pro in these pro-inflammatory signaling molecules. Uh, and this includes uh, things like, or the consequences that there are increased levels of LDH, fibrinogen, and in particular D-dimers, uh, particularly worrisome if they occur, uh, with alterations in the uh, prothrombin time and the activated uh, prothrombin uh, plus in time. So we see a whole variety of consequences of this. Now, this is not anything which is specific uh, to COVID. We've seen this before, going right back to the influenza pandemic in 1918, 1919, uh, which is thought to have been responsible, incidentally, for the, for the disproportionate number of deaths in younger people. And indeed, I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of this current pandemic, that whereas this pandemic is focused, as we've seen, so unfortunately on the older population, so that the average age of death from COVID in the UK, I think is 82 years. In the pandemic of 100 years ago, uh, it was younger people who were as likely to be involved. But in more recent times, we also saw it in the awful events at Northwick Park uh, in 2006, when a monoclonal antibody called therolizumab, uh, which, uh, is a, uh, which, which actually it caused, caused an abnormality or it's an agonist in effect for the, uh, the CD28 receptor for T cells. And that led to multi-organ failure when it was given to some healthy volunteers. Um, I think, I suspect people probably re will remember that really quite well. And that was a consequence of a cytokine storm because stimulating the T cell receptor led to this outpouring of a variety of, of um, uh, inflammatory uh, cytokines. So we've recognized it for some time, or at least 100 years actually, and we now know far more about it. But what still remains a bit of a mystery is that why some individuals are, are more prone to develop the problem than others. And in terms of when it starts post-COVID infections, seems to be at about two weeks. Uh, and one thing which a colleague of mine, Jess Manson, who's done a lot of work on the, the hemophagocytic lymphohistocytic uh, complication of COVID, has noticed uh, as a frontline worker, is that you may see a, uh, what seems to be an improvement after a short while, either spontaneously or after therapy, but it's the lull before the storm because having improved somewhat, it then can come back again, uh, and that, that's when it can be truly fatal. So it's, it seems to kick in when it's gonna kick in in about two weeks, but we still don't really know exactly exactly why some patients or some individuals are more prone to it than others. Yeah, and we're not going to go into the children's um, aspect today because we did that on a separate uh, webinar which can be found on 
RSM uh, webinars uh, via YouTube. Um, but it, it's a very important but small part of the, of the syndrome. Um, but what are the clinical consequences of the uh, COVID and cytokine storm in the adult population? Which particular organs does it affect? Uh, well, as, as I'm sure you, you, you're aware, be, because the receptor uh, for the um, uh, for the virus, it works through the ACE receptor, is pretty widespread on a number of, of cells, lung epithelial cells just to start with. Uh, so unfortunately, it has effects in the lung, it has effects in the kidney. Uh, these receptors are also found in the gastrointestinal tract. So when things really kick off in a, in a bad way, it can be the kidney, which is, which is uh, a particular side of the problem. And it seems to be also linked uh, to widespread thrombosis. And there's been a great deal of discussion in the hematological literature as to wh whether this uh, COVID-induced um, hematological problem represents a form of DIC. But actually, there's a lot of belief now that it's not the more classical DIC, but rather a sort of thrombotic microangiopathy, which is going on. Uh, and in various um, examinations of, of um, uh, of organs from people who die, both in China, for example, uh, and in Europe, uh, people have recorded um, evidence of these multiple uh, small thrombotic uh, lesions found in, in the kidneys, in a variety of other organs, and in the lung in particular. So it's the effects on the lung and the kidney which we are, we are particularly fear, uh, fearful of, actually. Uh, yeah. Would you say that the cytokine storm is the scene of the crime? So that precedes the vascular effects or do we not know whether it's vascular then? Cytokine? Well you're, you're right in the sense that uh, before you begin to see these these potentially fatal effects in the lung and the kidney you see more generalized effects uh, in, in particular fever uh, is is a particular one uh, as well as obviously the the, the more the, the better known associated complications uh, of the virus uh, which, which obviously we well know loss of sense, sense of taste and smell for, for example uh, and profound fatigue and we might want to get on to the the, the complications of the longer COVID as well, uh, but actually that, that sort of kicks in pretty quickly. Uh, so it, it really is a generalized widespread uh, set of problems in many organs and systems uh, with, with the real problems uh, which are likely to, to prove fatal kicking in after about two weeks. Yeah, great. Um, could you discuss steroids, tocilizumab, anakinra and anti-TNFs? That's quite a, a tall order, but it'd be just nice to go through the things okay. that we use anyway and are now being used in COVID. Okay, so as I mentioned, the virus is responsible for triggering a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and that includes things like TNF-alpha, uh, L6, L12, L18, L1, and um, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's half a joke, but I like to think that rheumatologists, or at least the drugs we use in rheumatology, uh, have been a bit of a lifesaver for a, a large number of, of people, because quite by chance, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we have used a number of monoclonal antibodies in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis, uh, which actually have proven to be of some use uh, in the treatment of COVID. But of course, the oldest one are steroids. Uh, now, the story behind steroids, I can't resist just saying a few words about that. Uh, so it was back in the 1920s uh, that an American uh, rheumatologist uh, identified that patients with rheumatoid arthritis, his name was Fred Hinch, by the way, patients with rheumatoid arthritis who got jaundiced seemed to get better very odd observation. And then in the 1930s, he observed that patients with rheumatoid arthritis who got pregnant seemed to get better. Now, Hench worked at the Mayo Clinic in North America, which is found in a little town called Rochester, so an hour's flying time outside of Chicago. And Hench worked with Kendall, a guy called Edward Kendall, who was a biochemist. And Kendall was very interested in what was coming out of the adrenal glands. And the two of them took to going down to the abattoirs adjacent to the Mayo Clinic, uh, and they would ask them for the adrenal glands, and they went back to their laboratories, and they would squeeze these glands, they would capture the fluid, and eventually they purified what they call compound X, which is actually called Cortisone. And the very first people on the planet ever to get steroids for anything were 14 little old ladies with rheumatoid arthritis. And they took some home movies, which I've seen quite remarkable pieces of medical history, actually, in which you see these, these elderly ladies with hands that look like this. And they're asked to walk across the, the old wooden gymnasium floor of the Mayo Clinic, and they can barely do it. And they're asked to climb over a little set of steps, and they can barely do that. And then they get an injection of compound X, which was actually cortisone, and then they're refilmed. And now, hey presto, they run over the steps. It's, it's a magic darts kind of time. Mm -hmm. And the first description of the clinical benefits of steroids appears in the proceedings of the Mayo Clinic in December 1948. 
And he got to the front page of the New York Times in February 49, which probably says steroids discovered cure for everything. But of course, it wasn't quite like that. And unfortunately, as you and I both know only really too well, the side effects of steroids are a major rate limiting step in just how, how many steroids, how much uh, prednisone in particular we, we can give. So dexamethasone has turned out to be of use in the treatment of patients with COVID. Uh, and we're still working out the best dosing regimes. Uh, and in fact, one of the great problems of, about all the drugs we're going to discuss this morning, this afternoon rather, is that we are still not quite certain whether they're best given as a cocktail. Are they best given sort of one to follow another? That, that we still don't know. We might also focus perhaps on uh, Donald Trump's experiences. Perhaps we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so we're not quite sure uh exactly how to give these things but we do know that steroids which are a very powerful anti-inflammatory drug can be very helpful we know because it blocks uh uh six that tocilizumab has been used with some success uh we know that there have been suggestions that the um, the classic TNF alpha blocking drugs might be useful, and there's a trial about to start with those. Uh, we know that anakinra, which blocks interleukin 1, might be of some value as well. Uh, and we know that uh, remdesivir, uh, which has been used uh, in a very different sort of uh, viral infection, the Ebola virus infection, may also be useful. But exactly the best combination, whether as cocktails, whether as, as, as sequential drugs, that, that's still yet to emerge. Um, yeah, so that brings us to President Trump. Uh, and in his case, but well, we never get there. <laughs> <laughs> he was treated very early with immune modulating drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, does this give us a kind of steer towards moving in that direction rather than waiting for a, a really florid cytokine storm to develop? Um, yep. Just want to discuss really what, what we think he had and his response that sure. we think he had. Yeah. So, so the, the, the Trump story uh, bears upon this in, in a number of ways, really. Uh, as you may know, he was very much in favor of, uh, well, for, we'll forget the bleach end, so we'll just part the bleach side. Of <laughs> but the hydroxychloroquine story is kind of interesting. We should just touch base on that, even if it will only be to dismiss it. So it was right back at the start of the, of the pandemic that a, uh, an investigator in Marseille called Didier Reu, who I always think looks like a cross between Iggy Pop and, Pop and Moses, actually. But it was he who came out and said, I think hydroxychloroquine is, is, is a good drug. And he gave some very uh, unimpressive evidence, I have to think we'd have to say that. Uh, and subsequently, I think it's been pretty clear from studies done in China and elsewhere that hydroxychloroquine great a drug as it is in the treatment of lupus and malaria, of course, which is where it started, doesn't really play a part in the treatment of COVID, uh, but it was reported that uh, uh, Trump was taking uh, hydroxychloroquine for some time. So I think what Donald Trump had, which, which sadly the rest of us don't have, was, was, was immediate access to a first-class medical team uh, at uh, the Walter Reed Hospital. So I think that, that was clearly very helpful. He clearly had oxygen and he clearly needed the oxygen. Uh, it said that he had um, uh, tocilizumab and or remdesivir. And he was also given two monoclonal antibodies, uh, which uh, were known to... Um, uh, well, I should say the clinical trials for these monoclonal antibodies have not yet been published. Uh, we know that these antibodies bind to a region on the main surface of the spike protein uh, that helps the virus to attach to the uh, and And he got these, I assume, as a, as a kind of a cocktail. Uh, and to be fair, it seems that in the course of a few days, he was able to, uh, to get substantially better. Uh, and it may be that that's the way to go in the future. But we still don't know very much about this, this antibody uh, concoction. Uh, the, the full clinical trial details have yet to emerge. Uh, and I don't think they've even been completed yet. So I think this was experimental treatment really they had. Uh, and just how widely available it's, it's going to be, I think will very much depend upon subsequent publications and, and your genuine proof that things actually work. Mm. Do you think there would be any harm bringing uh, steroids in early, um, or earlier than we are doing right now? Yes, so, uh, yeah, so that's a very important question, and, and also it bears upon questions which I've been asked, I'm sure you too, as to whether or not patients who are already on steroids by virtue of the drugs, the diseases that they have, are in some way protected against getting uh, COVID. Uh, and I think the truth is that we don't really know for sure. It would seem to be sensible that as soon as it becomes clear that your version of COVID is going to be more sinister, that you ought to get dexamethasone, it does seem to be both helpful and reducing the amount of time you've got to spend in hospital and on intensive care units. So I think the early introduction of steroids to me makes a lot of sense. We know that in the short term, dexamethasone is not going to have the nasty side effects, you know, the osteoporosis, the increased risk of infection, other, other infections, uh, the high blood pressure. 
um, uh, etc. That that isn't going to be a problem with dexamethasone uh, given in in the sh relatively short term at the start of this disease or close to the start of this disease. So I think if the patients are your patient is not doing well, I think dexamethasone early seems to me to make a lot of sense. Mm. And there are some very specific blood changes, aren't there? When the uh, cytokine storm is on on the way or um, That's right. know, so see very high levels of LDH, yeah. um, see high levels of fibrinogen, uh, uh, D-dimers is very, very important. And as I mentioned at the start, uh, abnormalities in the uh, uh, in the uh, prothrombin time and the activated partial throm uh, thromboplastin time. Uh, yeah. and that's, that's particularly high in, in, in bacterial infections. Um, actually, in the, the, there are some subtle differences between uh, the, the changes that we see with DIC and the changes that we see with the thrombotic uh, microangiopathy, which has made people think uh, that COVID is more likely to cause the TMA rather than the DIC form of, of uh, hematological um, uh, involvement. Yeah, and the lymphocytes are usually low, aren't they? With a uh, lymphocytes are a little bit low um, uh, in these very severe cases. Hemoglobin may be down a little bit. Platelets may be down a little bit. Uh, so um, all of these things, it clearly has very profound effects. So would you watch the CRP as the main marker? Yeah, uh, CRP absolutely can be extremely high, and uh, profound elevations of the of the D dimers are, are also associated very clearly with a greatly increased risk of, of mortality. So you measure the CRP regularly, measure the D dimer regularly, uh, and you've got to look at these other things: the uh, the LDH and the PT and the uh, uh, activated PTT. You're going to watch those very closely. Yeah, and I was listening to Beverly Hunt's um, talk, RSM talk, and she was saying essentially that if you control the cytokine storm you probably reduce all the thrombotic tendency or most of it uh, is that the case that that seems to be the case there seems to be it's a it's a sort of uh, as a consequence of the virus you get this upregulation in the cytokines and the cytokines in turn have effect uh, on on blood vessels and, and the cells within those blood vessels uh, and that seems to be driving the thrombotic microangiopathy that is clearly i think a problem or a major problem uh, and there's also damage to the endothelial cells because they're damaged by the virus itself. Do you right. think this could be the trigger for the cytokine response and the vascular repercussions or do we just not know yet? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's very plausible. Uh, what I think remains intriguing, as I've said, is the, uh, the tremendously variable individual responses. Now, we know, as everybody now knows, unfortunately, that um, if you have a serious underlying disease, such as hypertension, such as diabetes, uh, that you are at greater risk of succumbing to this disease. Uh, both of these conditions, hypertension and diabetes, have profound vascular effects. So you're starting there with a, with a blood vessel system, which is already damaged to some extent. And it's remarkable how this virus seems to pick up on this. It seems to sort of go for people who, who are disadvantaged to some extent. And I, I always remember reading with um, great interest the very first uh, autopsy study, well, sorry, a mortality study, I should say, which came out of Northern Italy right at the start of the pandemic, in which they looked at the first 500 people who died in Northern Italy, and they asked the questions, well, what was special or unfortunate about those people? Well, the average age was 78, and 99% of them had one or more serious underlying disease, and 49% had three or more serious underlying diseases. So, Again, to draw the comparison with the pandemic from 1918, 1919, uh, this is a disease which focuses on much more on the elderly, more damaged person, whereas the pandemic of, of 100 years ago seemed to go after everybody, young children, young adults, as well as the elderly was likely to die in that, in that pandemic. So, yeah, thank you. It looks as though there's another theme as well with the so-called young and um, people who haven't got any uh, diabetes or hypertension, uh, that they might get a fairly mild uh, course of COVID, but then they go on to get the long COVID symptoms, which there are a lot of parallels with uh, rheumatology. So symptoms which fit with polymyalgia rheumatica um, and the raised CRP and the, the, the blood um, changes can persist in those people. Um, so are we seeing much of those patients in the clinics yet or we, should we be setting up protocols to try and encourage people to refer them in so they can get treated? Yeah. 
So it's a very important question, but, but, but perhaps just before I answer it directly, just to sort of, again, just to back up just a little bit. So it's, I think, very intriguing in the current wave that we're seeing that we're not seeing the huge spike in the number of deaths. And some figures were published yesterday, graphs were published yesterday, showing that the, obviously in any population, there's an expected number of deaths uh, that you see month to month. Uh, and that number is not currently being exceeded. It's very interesting in spite of these, this vast increase, 20,000 plus, patients in the UK being uh, identified as, as being positive for the virus, that's not been accompanied by the sort of wave of deaths that we saw back in April, May. And certainly my own hospital, the first hospital, at the height of the pandemic, we had well over uh, 200 positive COVID positive patients and 60 plus patients on respirators. Last Thursday, I think we had 17 positive patients in the hospital and just one or two on respirators. And talking to a colleague up in Newcastle last night, uh, again, they had about 70, they currently have about 70 positive uh, COVID patients. It was about you know, two to three times that number back in, in April, May. Uh, and yet we're not seeing that that vast increase in the number of deaths. It's certainly gone up compared to the beginning of August, but it's it's not at the sort of the, the horrible heights that it hit in, in the early months of the pandemic. But to get back to your question, yes, amongst the young people, younger persons who are getting it, on the whole, as you know, most younger people who get it, get it and it's either asymptomatic or the symptoms are over in three or four days, like a mild flu or something. But there do, again, seem to be some people, and again, we're not sure precisely who they are, precisely why they're being singled out, who seem to suffer these longer symptoms. And of course, what we don't know, considering that, you know, the virus, uh, you know, which of us had heard of coronaviruses back in January of this year? So, you know, it's, it's we, we talk about long COVID, but actually we're talking about something which we've hardly been aware of for more than about six to nine months, really. Mm -hmm. So you're right. There are some interesting similarities to some of the patients that we see in our rheumatology clinics, patients with long-standing fatigue. Some patients may or not, all well, these patients may or not, may have slightly raised CRP. Mm -hmm. We make an assumption in some of those cases that there's an inflammatory component to that. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting just to see if these sort of patients might show a response to hydroxychloroquine, which at least is pretty non-toxic. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, as you and I have discussed outside of this, this call, maybe a lowish dose of steroids for a short period of time might be helpful. In fact, I'd like to turn it back to you to study, perhaps tell us about your experience of using low doses of steroids in these patients, because I think you've seen more than I have. Yes, I've seen about five patients with polymyalgic type symptoms and with a raised CRP. And in one of the patients, it had an enormously high CRP, so it's greater than 200. So we thought he had something else. We screened him for absolutely everything, all negative. And um, he was diabetic, just to be convenient. So he was started on low dose steroids, 15 milligrams. And then we actually brought in methotrexate, which as a steroid sparing agent, and it actually turned the disease around, which was a bit of a, a gamble, but it made a big difference to his well-being and his inflammatory markers. So he's improving on combination of tapering down steroids from 15 milligrams a day and low dose methotrexate. I think he's on uh, 15 milligrams weekly. So you know, it's just one case, but it, it's interesting. Well, no, that's right. No, that, that's extremely interesting. Uh, and just for the benefit of, of uh, those who are listening to us, uh, in terms of, of what we regard as a low dose of steroids, we, we should perhaps just have a chat about that. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of work's been done in the United States is to try to work at what's the safe dose of steroids. Uh, and the answer seems to be about six milligrams per day. If you're on six milligrams or less, you're, you're in what I call the safe zone. Your chances of getting significant steroid side effects are vanishingly small. But for each one, two, three, four milligrams above that, you, you're going to run into more and more problems. Problems. So although, as you've suggested, Stephanie, you might, for these sort of patients, you might be tempted to kick in with a standard polymyalgic dose of about 15 milligrams, the aim has to be to try to get them down, even though they're younger and there's most likely to be osteoporotic to start with, but you want to get them down as fast as you can to around six milligrams or less, and you can pretty much relax both you and the patient there afterwards. Good. Um, and then it, looking at protocols, I think the BMJ, or one of the writers in the BMJ, has uh, done a protocol for primary care for referral of these patients to, um, you know, to long COVID clinics and rehabilitation. I think one of the big problems will be funding of those clinics. It's, it's really necessary that the government will fund, the, you know, the rehabilitation and treatment of these patients. Um, so perhaps we should work with the rehabilitation specialists and maybe take the more subacute ones, um, and, you know, and support them, obviously, with the the longer rehab patients um, together with the physios. Um, have, have you seen much in the way of reactive arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, you know, the conditions that we see normally actually occurring in 
in close succession to having COVID infection. Have you seen any of that? The problem is, is of course, that the, the epidemiology here is, is challenging because in, in, in any given population, you're going to have a number of people presenting with uh, ankylosing spondylitis, with psoriatic arthritis, with reactive arthritis. And some of those people will quite by chance have had COVID. So to say that the, the, the two things are actually linked is currently, I think, a step too far. I mm. think we're still in, in, the, in the, um, the, the, the time zone of trying to work out the connections, if there are connections. So currently, I think it would be very hard to be convincing uh, that there was a, an obvious link between COVID infection and reactive arthritis or, or whatever. Mm. I think that, that will emerge over time as the numbers become a little bit bigger, they're better studied. I think we have to be very mindful of the fact that we, we obviously literally don't know what the true long-term sequelae of this condition are going to be. So it's up to rheumatologists, yourself, myself, etc., and all our other colleagues to keep very close eye on what what's we see coming into our clinics. Mm. I've got no doubt we will see some long COVID patients coming in because, as you said, because of myalgia, arthralgia, whatever, uh, those patients we will, we will get to be seen. But as patients turn up to us with reactive arthritis, with psoriatic arthritis, new cases, clearly one of the questions we're going to have to ask there was, have you had a COVID infection recently? We'll, we'll need to find that information out. That would be very interesting, wouldn't it? And, and back to our own patients, so our rheumatoid patients, lupus patients who are often on anti-TNFs, methotrexate, rituximab, JAK inhibitors, do they tend to do better if they catch COVID or worse? Have we got any information on yeah, that? Yeah, so that's really interesting. As, as, uh, as you know, Stephanie, I run a very big lupus clinic and, and I was very, very worried at the beginning of the pandemic that I'd see lots of my lupus patients on relatively large amounts of steroids and immunosuppressive drugs, that they would be getting COVID much more easily. And in fact, that hasn't been borne out. But I think there are two reasons for that. One, because these patients are very mindful of, of, of this infection and their condition and the drugs that they're on, and they have stayed hidden away. I think uh, most of the lupus patients that I spoke to on telephone consult calls were, were not going out at all for months. So I think that was that was very important. And the other thing, of course, is that they are younger. So the average age of onset of our 750 odd lupus patients in our clinic is about 28 years. And as I've said, the average age of death of a COVID patient was 82 years. So I think being younger and staying far from the Maddie crowd, as it were, uh, literally the Maddie crowd in some cases, uh, I, I think that's been very uh, helpful to the patients. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen a small number of our lupus patients have developed COVID and a very small number of deaths, but I can't say there's been any great uh, vast increase in deaths from COVID in the lupus patients. Yeah. With the rheumatoid patients, slightly different story because obviously that, that, that they are that much older. Mm -hmm. uh, so they tend to be female more than male and of course COVID is, is common in males compared to females so that, that may again give them some degree of protection. Um, so at, at the moment I, I think uh, the, the, the numbers are still kind of coming in uh, and we and other groups around the UK and around the world obviously are, are looking at this right now but I can't say to you that I have been stunned by a great a vast array of lupus and rheumatoid patients uh, succumbing to COVID uh, so the answer is, is kind of no, but I don't think we, we have all the data in yet. Yes. And then, interestingly, there's a, a Liverpool study which has started using anti-TNF biologics in the community, in the elderly. Um, and I think the patients are asymptomatic in this study. Have you... Yeah, so that's really interesting. And I know Mark Feldman, who obviously was involved, uh, uh, very closely involved in the development of the very first TNF alpha blocking drugs uh, in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis patients over 20 years ago. Uh, Mark has published a letter in the, in the Lancet strongly advocating that TNF alpha or blocking TNF alpha would potentially be a very useful way to go in patients with COVID. So I was kind of delighted to see that this study was being set up uh, because clearly if it works, the beauty of it is we've now got 20 years plus experience of using drugs uh, 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 like adalimumab uh, as, as, as an example, but there are plenty of others, of course, and, and lots of biosimilars. So we have a great experience now of using these drugs, lots of, of um, cheaper versions of the original drugs, Embrel, uh, Infliximab, et cetera. So it wouldn't be too expensive to use them. And if they're effective, especially in this targeted group who are much more likely to get the disease and to die from it, I think that would be win-win. That would be really good. Yeah. And, and then moving on to something uh, simpler, actually, vitamin D, vitamin D3, has been found to be very important um, in the population, and especially a population who's gone through lockdown and probably not exposed to enough light. Um, 
what would you say about vitamin D levels? Um, like, a very that? interesting question. So I, I'd commend to you a really interesting uh, overview of the story of vitamin D and viruses written by a guy called uh, Adrian Martino, published 2017, looking at the use of vitamin D in its capacity to reduce the risk of acute respiratory tract infections. And it appears that 25-hydroxy vitamin D has the capacity to support the induction of antimicrobial peptides, whether due to viral infections uh, or um, bacterial infections. So there's some pretty good science behind the idea that vitamin D, which is obviously very simple to, 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 to provide, may have a part to play. Now, we still await the results of, of uh, bigger studies uh, which are being carried out uh, in the context of COVID at the moment to know just how true that is for COVID. But in general terms, I think vitamin D is really a good thing. Uh, mm. It's pretty cheap, it's widely available. Mm. Why not use it? I, I think it would be good. And you're also right that clearly because people have been staying inside for so long, not coming outside, uh, their vitamin D levels are likely to be low. So I think measuring the 25 hydroxy levels would be very important. Uh, and I'd certainly encourage using it. So I'm recommending most people to go on a thousand IU a day. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you. Know. Yeah. Um, so what is the current thinking on remdesivir? We mentioned hydroxychloroquine, that's been debunked. NSAIDs in the beginning were thought to be harmful. I think they're now thought not to be. And Regeneron, um, the, the trial on Regeneron. Any thoughts on those? Yeah, well, the, the Regeneron trial, that, that's, that's linked to the, the, the antibody treatment that uh, Donald Trump had that, uh, that I've, I've commented on. What I'd like to do, if I may, Stephanie, is just to sort of touch on the question of vaccines. Can I say something about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, the, obviously the key question that we're all trying to answer is how do you get rid of a nasty viral infection which causes the pandemic? And the history of, of vaccinology is truly fascinating, I think, because we, we've got this great sort of spread of effects. If we look at smallpox, a disease thought by some to have emerged out of India about 11,000 years ago, a great scourge of mankind, undoubtedly the cause of, of, of deaths, the death of, of many, many millions of people throughout the last uh, three to four to 5,000 years. And yet when the right vaccine came along in the 1970s, it completely removed this, this horrendous disease, the scourge of mankind, completely gone. So much so that in fact, the last patient on the planet, as far as I'm aware, to actually suffer from it was a technician in a laboratory in Birmingham where they were, they were sort of doing some experiments with it. And it appears that the virus got out and this killed the technician. This was about 1978. Not a single case since then, completely ablated, gone for real. And you contrast that, for example, with HIV, another scourge of mankind, which came along about 40 years ago now, for which we never got a vaccine, never had a vaccine for HIV, and yet we developed some very effective antiviral drugs so that nowadays, if you get HIV, if you're HIV positive, we put you onto a combination of those drugs. And again, it, it's, it's pretty much a non-issue now. We can treat it very, very effectively. And then you contrast that with the influenza story, where again, we have vaccines, but they have to be renewed every year. So one wonders where on this spectrum the COVID vaccines are going to be, because on the one hand, you could say to me, look, there's 125, whatever it is, attempts around the world trying to produce a vaccine. We just need one to be successful. That's all we need. And I have to confess, I'm, I'm hoping for the AstraZeneca one simply because I'm in that trial. So I'm praying that, that one is going to be successful. But um, I, I, I think... My a colleague at work here, David Lomas, who's one of our deans, uh, has said that he, in his view, as a respiratory physician, he suspects that a COVID vaccine is more likely to come into the influenza category than the other great success or, or the great failure. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting if you look at the nature of coronaviruses themselves, there are thought to be about eight members of the family and four seem to cause us as human beings no particular problem. Uh, but the other four clearly have done the species a great deal of harm. They've been responsible for the two SARS uh, epidemics, the MERS epidemics, and now, now the COVID epidemic. But also worthwhile pointing out that of what we call the common flu, about 15% of patients with the so-called flu were actually due to coronaviruses. So actually, as a species, we've, we've, we've known of these viruses for quite some time. Uh, what we're going to get with the vaccines, we don't know. We hope that we'll get the results of the Oxford AstraZeneca trial out in December, January. I believe that's that's the time frame. Uh, but there are lots of other drugs, uh, lots of other vaccines coming through. Uh, obviously, we're all praying that one of them is going to be successful. But where they're going to fit into that that that, that spectrum of, of vaccines, that we'll have to wait and see. Meaning, how often we'll have to have them? Will it be? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
indeed. And, and just to cover a, a couple of worries that were early on in the pandemic, uh, rheumatologists in particular, who were really worried to give uh, joint injections with steroids and intramuscular injections of steroids, say for acute gout or rheumatoid, to get the disease under control. So have, has this been kind of debunked again as, as being dangerous? I, I think, yes, I think pretty much, I think it's, especially since it was shown that dexamethasone actually was quite useful. So yeah. I, I personally no longer have any concerns about injecting patients with a, that's a single swollen joint due to uh, you know, a very nasty attack of gout or, 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 or whatever, or a route to a patient with a, with a bad knee or whatever. Uh, I personally have no problems with that. Do, do you have a problem with that? I'm, I'm, I'm personally um, very happy no, to but, but to usual usage. Yeah, right, practice, exactly, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, the NSAIDs, I mean, just to, to say, they weren't found to be of any harm whatsoever, were they? No, as far as, far as I'm, from what I've seen, from what I've read, and from, from my own practice, I continue to prescribe them and haven't seen that to be a problem. Okay, great. So um, I think we've gone through pretty well everything that everyone asked in the pre-questions. And um, is there anything else you'd like to cover before... Well, uh, obviously, we live in truly remarkable times, and almost every day we're, we're seeing um, new challenges, uh, we're seeing new ideas for therapy, uh, and I think the next six months clearly will be critical, uh, both in terms of the vaccinology, be fantastic if one of them just turned out to work, but I think what we now need are some guidance about the potential tools that we have to treat uh, the, the this the the second wave um we hope there won't be a third wave it's again it's interesting if you compare to the uh uh the, the spanish flu pandemic there were three waves there uh the first wave uh in the first part i think it was 1918 uh was not particularly troublesome but it was the second wave ironically in october which really did the damage and between 30 and 40 million people are thought to have died from that second wave and then there was a third wave which came out the following spring but that didn't do as much harm uh and then the disease intriguingly seem to fade away uh, and I do think one of the most remarkable pieces of science that I, I've read about in years was was published a few years ago uh, it was known that um, the, the virus which spread all over the world as, as you know uh, and it was known to affect uh, some of the Inuit people who live in the frozen tundra part of, of Canada and I think it's about 2003 that this was done uh, a body was dug up of an Inuit woman called Lucy uh, and they were able to take some samples because her body had, had been frozen literally all that time. They took some samples from her body of which they were able to identify the actual virus uh, and they sequenced it. So we know the exact sequence of the virus which caused the pandemic of Spanish flu. Uh, and I can't help also mentioning that why is it called Spanish flu? So it's nothing to do with Spain really other than the fact that the reporting restrictions in Spain were far more lenient than they were in other European countries in particular. So there's simply more information appeared in the Spanish press than anywhere else. That's how it got its name. And if I could just end up with one, one tiny little story I, I, I spoke uh, two weeks ago to the father of a very good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Charlie, and Charlie is going to be 103 on Saturday. Mm. And all marble still there, he's a retired GP, and he said to me, you know, I, he regards it as remarkable that his life has been bookended by these two pandemics. He said, I was one year old in the Spanish flu, and now he had 102, is his second pandemic. He said, I survived the first, I'm determined to survive the second. Good, <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was an absolutely brilliant webinar. And uh, I, hopefully we did manage to include, well, we certainly included most of the questions that were sent before um, we, you know, we hosted this. So I, I'm very pleased and very grateful to you for giving up your time to come and speak to us about this most important topic. It's going to be really important now that our, our caseload is going up um, and you know, to deal with the, the ones who are survivors and relatively young, but um, affected by it. So. Thank you so much, David. That's really okay. good. Thanks for the invitation. Lovely to see you again. Take oh, care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and just to say to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in to us. And our next COVID-19 webinar is next Thursday, the 29th of October. And this is going to offer a GP perspective of the, of the pandemic and will feature the Royal College of GPs Chair Martin Marshall and Dame Claire Gerarda. So this is going to be a very good, um, interesting webinar for us. And then also, if you have enjoyed this webinar, please consider becoming a member of the RSM um, as the charity, like many other charities, but particularly us because we're doing such, um, uh, you know, frontier work, needs your support to continue with this kind of educational programme. So we'd be very pleased if we got uh, some donations, that would be 
really fantastic. But um, that's all from me uh, to sign off and thank you to everyone for coming and thank you very much, David. <laughs>